Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I am your host of this evening's Airway Health Solutions Conversation uh, with special guest, Dr. Kevin Boyd. Welcome, Dr. Boyd. Thanks for being with us. I know we're going to have a lot of uh, fun this evening because tonight's topic is really meant to be more of a, uh, to pose a question to our listeners and the dental professionals at large. So our topic is, is there a right age to start interceptive ortho? And I know, um, Dr. Boyd, you wanted me to kind of share this <laughs> title screen here. So let me go and do that um, because we can kind of lead in to, to this, you know, uh, of your thoughts. Let me just give a little bit of your background, if I may. Um, Dr. Boyd is a board certified pediatric dentist practicing in Chicago. How many years are you practicing now, Dr. Boyd? Oh my God, people do the math. Over 30. Over, Over 30. 30, okay. So a lot of kiddos you've seen, and more importantly, a lot of kiddos you've helped uh, to breathe, sleep, and thrive. So kudos to you. Um, you're also an attending instructor in the residency training program in pediatric dentistry at Lurie Children's Hospital, where you additionally serve as a dental consultant to the sleep medicine service. And I also like that you're recently appointed as an adjunct assistant professor in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Arkansas. I thought that's a a great tidbit. You also have your master's in human nutrition. Um, you've done so many postgraduate residencies that we already have that recorded. So if anyone wants to listen to your bio, they can go and listen to a good 10 minute segment there on all your accomplishments. But I know you wanted to dive in today. So let's go ahead and start with this uh, $10 million question. Is there a right age to start interceptive ortho? And are you running your poll or is there Well, I'm not, I'm afraid to do it because I just know you wanted to kind of touch on this. So let, well, let me, me, let me share, ahead. can I share my screen now? Because please, the answer is, it's not a real simple yes, no question, but, um, but it kind of is, I, I know. Okay. Vague, but um, let me know if you can see us, you and me there. Can you? Yep. Okay, good. We actually have the same pose there. <laughs> hey, here we go. So um, let me, okay. Is there indeed a right age to start interceptive ortho? And, but it's complicated. <laughs> okay. And I am going to unpack over the next, I don't know, 35, 40 minutes, I hope I get, but uh, we'll see what happens. Um, if, and if there's just a pressing question that you read, Lauren, from the yeah. audience, just interrupt me. Just say, Look, well, you know what? I'm going to actually start interrupting you, sorry, right away, because there are so many questions on, you know, we're saying, is there a right age to start interceptive ortho? But what is your definition of interceptive ortho? Let's start there. Well, that's going to be my first slide. Yeah. But Excellent. before <laughs> you do that, um, this is something that, um, this is a guy who died at 35 years old, uh, 3,000 years ago, okay? And this is a patient who just transferred uh, to my practice uh, when I took the picture from Seattle. And can you tell me anything about what this kid, he's, I'll give you a hint, he's 13, okay? A geriatric patient to me. Um, but he's 13 years old um, and when I took this picture. Um, can anyone tell, could, could, could it be reliably, um, retrospectively talked about what his jaw looked like when he was four? And then the same question, how about this guy? Can you tell me what he looked like at four? I mean, you can't go back in time, right? So I'm gonna make an argument that 100%, I can tell you what this guy looked like at two, but I can't tell you what he looked like I don't know, I had six months ago, okay, how come? Because if a kid didn't look, if, if this guy at 35 didn't look like this at five or six, six years old, guess what? He, and like this guy, he wouldn't have survived childhood. This kid died, obviously, um, with a perfect arch, okay? But this is how this kid came to me from Seattle. So you can, a, a child, up until fairly recently, if they didn't have a perfect uh, pre-primary and primary dentition, 
uh, you know, before, um, you know, five years, four or five years old, they didn't live to reproduce. They didn't pass on their genes, but all kinds of things, kids can survive uh, with things that used to kill us in the past. Uh, you know, so I won't go into that, but it's true. And this is the, with, a, with a high degree of scientific certainty, what I just said. Um, so anyway, okay, I'm, Boyd, I'm just gonna interrupt you because I know you wanted to do the poll in the beginning and I was able to, um, to relaunch okay. it. So yeah, do you want yeah. me to go ahead and we'll yeah. get some data? Because we're curious to see, um, I'm sorry, but this is the first time I'm doing a poll. So hopefully it popped up. If you could just answer the two questions. Number one is what age do you recommend children be screened for malocclusion? Please just answer a single choice. And number two, what age do you recommend children diagnosed with malocclusion be treated or referred for treatment? Oh, it's working. I love it. <laughs> I always get nervous with this new technology, but excellent. Can you see that there, Kev? Yeah, it's perfect. It's Great. perfect. How long should I wait? I, I mean, it, you, let's get, we got 62%. Don't be shy. Let's see if we can get everyone participating if you can. But we got a good chunk, almost up to 70%. And they can, even after I keep going, maybe they're waiting for me to give them some more evidence. That's okay. <laughs> I just wanted their initial reaction. So this is very helpful. Um, Let's close it. We got 100% answered on the diagnosed with malocclusion. So that seems to be, you can see the results there, 75 people answered and uh, close to the, the, um, the intervention part, it's not as clear, but we got a nice survey there. So you can kind okay. of see. Yeah, that's great. So um, they can keep voting as I keep, sure. if I, yeah. Okay, um, so anyway, these are some metrics I'm going to talk about uh, tonight, um, but you know, relative to the to the question, is there a right age? It, you know, is there a best age? And I'm going to you know de develop an argument. Here's what's in the literature in the orthodontic literature is that deciduous dentition malocclusion predicts orthodontic treatment need later. Now that's like an ophthalmologist saying nearsighted four-year-olds, that predicts that they'll be ready for the first set of glasses when they're driving your car. And I, I'm saying, you know, that is just not ethical. Actually, it's medically indefensible. It, uh, no ophthalmologist, uh, eye doctor would ever do that. But it's done every single day in orthodontic practices and the people with whom they get their referrals, you guys, okay? So, that's my argument that I'm gonna make is that this article really felt like they were doing a big service by saying, oh my gosh, you know, and then they call crossbite and open bite. You know, those are the worst things. You can have transverse deficiency in vertical problems without having open bites or cross bites. Uh, little did we know, huh? So um, <clears throat> they're inviting me to share in the poll, but I'm speaking, so I'm not gonna do it. That's okay. <laughs> So anyway, so I'm just going to keep going here. Yep. It's a good analogy. And if you, you know, boy, you may think I'm full of crap and that's fine. That's how I started. I did some of the stuff when I started learning this, I thought these people were nuts. And you know what? Um, here's to the crazy ones. That's, that's what they said about, uh, was it Bill Gates or, or Steve Jobs? But anyway, it's a good analogy. If somebody says, um, Boy, you're gonna have to do it all over again. Oh, really? Like a little four-year-old that, that has glasses for nearsightedness that won't get better on its own, cannot self-correct, will get worse, and can be associated with systemic neurological problems? Well, malocclusion can follow the same pathway because of its impact uh, on suboptimal sub mode of breathing, mode of respiration. Uh, so really the best analogy, if you've, really you want to help a kid and and you can see that that the the jaw is not optimal for for this child's uh, ability to breathe through the nose and sleep well um and the parents are doubting just say look what about glasses you know so a kid who's diagnosed at, at three or four with nearsightedness they may have six different pair of glasses oh they're going to get burned out on glasses and that's the argument is that there's this treatment fatigue that the kids will get burned out on ortho. No, they won't. They, no, they won't. How do I know? And I'm gonna talk about what's been happening in my practice over the last 30 years. 
Um, same thing now, the, the, the orthodontic profession has acknowledged that pediatric patients with apnea, um, there, there's an orthodontic connection here. Um, this is a trial that was done in uh, Canada and England. Um, but what they're saying is we need to develop an index so we can tell parents that, oh, we better deal with that malocclusion uh, you know, when the kid's older. Um, because we can tell right now the malocclusion will not self-correct. A third-year dental student, sometimes depending on where you went to school, can tell a parent of a four-year-old, save up your money for braces. That what we were we were taught to say is that's a that's a good patient service to have uh, parents prepare financially for inevitable non-corrective mal non-correcting non-self-correcting malocclusion. So I'm not going to show a lot of papers now, but if, if people don't understand the link between mouth breathing and, and poor sleep and inattention and, and uh, you know, self-regulation, self-control, impulse control, these are all things that, if you've heard me talk before about lifespan and health span, when, when you help a kid sleep and breathe better, you're gonna help them live longer and you're gonna have them, help them stay healthy into older age. Um, this was just published in uh, the uh, JAMA cardiology, kids with sleep apnea will develop in, in adolescence, they will develop hypertension, cardiovascular disease. Well, what does that say to you? And there's nothing mentioned in this article about malocclusion. This isn't common knowledge. Now it's been around for a long time. There's medical and dental journals that report on the relationship between maxillary transverse deficiency, that's the biggie, and uh, poor attention and inability to sleep and breathe well, uh, respiratory issues. So I'm going to move through this because I've talked about it. This is what, if you go on the um, AAO, American Association of Orthodontists website, they call interceptive ortho, they call it phase one of a two phase treatment. Now I'm glad they say that because you, when we do phase one on somebody, when we do interceptive treatment, I never tell parents you are done, I say, this is going to make their second phase of treatment maybe Invisalign eligible. Uh, they won't have to have full braces, but they will benefit from corrective ortho when they're older. Okay. But then they say, uh, you know, two phase orthodontic treatment begins when child still have some baby tooth. I beg to differ or only have only baby teeth. Okay. That should be in there. And, and it's not, I, and it, you know, I added that. Um, so, they, I'm, I'm doing this out of order because that's the way this is listed on their website. Two-phase orthodontic treatment can be used to help jaws develop, ensure adequate space. That's good. For what? All their teeth? Yes, their tongues. If, you, if a child has room for their tongue at any age, they're going to have the ability to breathe through their nose. It doesn't mean they will, but that's the first structural component that we deal with. And it does uh, seem to, to predict that they will have room for their permanent teeth at different ages. And I'm going to show you how to calculate it at different ages. Normalize the relationship between the upper and lower jaw, especially in the cases of underbite. Okay, so I'm going to hit that one tonight because, oh my gosh, we have the blessing of the American Association of Orthodontists to deal in early treatment with maxillary insufficiency. Okay, underbite. And, and that's good because this is a layman's uh, page, so they, they don't say class three maxillary uh, insufficiency or hypoplasia, mid-phase deficiency. Two-phase orthodontic is for kids, but not for all kids. Most orthodontic problems can be treated in one phase, one pair of glasses, wait till you're 16. However, there are a few exceptions. Now, I have a way of rewording that. Two-phase orthodontic treatment is for kids, but it's not for all kids. According to most conventionally trained orthodontists, orthodontic problems can be treated in one phase by most, according to the ADA's uh, curriculum guidelines, orthodontists. However, there are a few exceptions, meaning orthodontists like Bill Hang, like Barry, Barry Raphael, Darren Ward. There's, there are lots of orthodontists, uh, Brett Christensen, that are, that are doing this treatment. So I'm saying, it's conventional training that, that really make it so that um, they can only, they say only do one phase. Well, that's really all they're comfortable with doing. The, the code of curriculum for orthodontics has no 
expectations or, or didactic or clinical experience requirements for behavior guidance techniques uh, for, for child development courses. You wouldn't believe the amount of hours that I had at the University of Iowa. Our, our director, Jimmy Pinkham, had a PhD in education, childhood development. So we had to take lots of theory courses in child development, child psychology, and we had to demonstrate that we had competence in managing anxiety, not only in children, mostly relative to restorative uh, issues, but the parents, the parents have anxiety. So in most orthodontic residents or pediatric dentistry residents are not parents when, when they get out of their training or they're very young parents. So they, you can't even retrofit them based upon their own parenting skills. That's part of a technique you know, that, that we teach in a course. We, we just, you know, like in, in World War II, I grew up in a, in a town that made engine blocks for General Motors that was near Lake Michigan and they had sandblasting and they, they so, the, but that during World War II was turned into a Sherman tank factory, retrofitting, okay? I'm saying that, uh, you know, people who are general dentists, orthodontists or pediatric dentists that want to serve children better besides just doing restorative, you can be retrofitted if you're a parent easily. I became a much better pediatric dentist after I became a parent. So this is out there. They say age seven. Now the actual um, meeting, the AAO meeting that, that this came from in the 90s said that children should be treated, be, be, be uh, assessed and treated for malocclusion as soon as it's seen, but certainly no later than seven. Well, what orthodontist is going to see a child before age seven? Which, what pediatric dentist is gonna to refer to an orthodontist who says, I don't wanna see them until they're older? So they're not seeing these kids when the malocclusion first shows up. So this, this really, and in, in according to Buzz Barents, Ralph Barents, who's former, uh, he might still be editor of the AAO, AGODO, um, is that there's no evidence behind this. They just made this up. It made sense. So anyway, um, I'm going to, uh, talk a little bit about dimensions, okay? All malocclusion should be analyzed in three dimensions. First is transverse, and that is the green light. That is the most abundant, it's the easiest to fix, and it's also comorbidity with all the other dimensions. Uh, the other one is sagittal problems, and sagittal problems are yellow light. They're, they're not that easy to fix, but they're always associated with transverse problems. So you never have you know, a crossbite that's transverse. Well, yeah, that's a, that's a transverse. That's like saying almost blind um, is, is really when you're, you need glasses. Uh, so um, the, the, uh, this is the transverse dimension. Edward Bogue was a, a physician dentist who lived in the late 19th century, early 20th century who uh, practiced all over the world. And he limited his practice to kids under six years old. And he wanted to, what he called, spread the deciduous arch uh, in order to improve respiration. Uh, no time to go into that now, but look at some of the titles of these articles. And if you've heard me talk before, you know I pay attention to this whole literature. Um, and this is the Bogue Index, which, you know, if you don't have 28 millimeters, uh, at the palatal cusp, me mesial lingual cusp of the upper second primary molars by age four, that kid is already growth deficient. And this is borne out in a longitudinal study um, at Case Western University called the Bolton Brush Study. And I'm gonna talk about that. <clears throat> so we've done that, sorry. So this I got from our friend, Ben Maraglia. Um, the maldeveloped maxilla is the criminal. Okay, and my patients really love that. I always get a big grin that makes sense uh, when I go over the, the cep and pan with, with parents. And the maldeveloped mandible is the victim. Is it, if you've got a well-developed maxilla, and that's really, I hope all of you take away from this, is that I'm not saying don't be concerned about transverse problems or vertical issues, because they do have to be paid attention to, and parents do need to understand the importance but if you just take care of the transverse dimension uh, at an early age, um, you are gonna be doing a great service to that child and setting him up for much easier treatment and much more effective treatment uh, when they address fully the other dimensions. So 
when you're expanding the upper arch, the lower arch will come with it. It has a point of diminishing returns, in which case you'll start to create a scissors bite or a reverse cross bite. Don't worry about that. It, it, it's just not a worry. Then you start to add the lower expansion. But this has been, uh, been in the literature for decades. Uh, <clears throat> so here it is, the craniofacial respiratory complex, okay? You cannot separate the facial complex, facial mandibular complex from the respiratory complex, even the auditory complex, um, and, and you know, uh, visual acuity and olfactory acuity. You know, all these things are connected, but we're gonna focus on the respiratory complex. So transverse dimension is first, green light. Assess it. If you're not comfortable, if you've never corrected a crossbite, guess what? It ain't hard. It's not rocket science. Uh, but, you know, anyone who's corrected a crossbite, you know how to deal with transverse deficiency. But a Bogue index without a crossbite will validate that that kid needs expansion. Even, and this is, uh, Bogue worked at, at Harvard for a while, Forsyth Institute there. Um, I think his study models are still there because of the pandemic, I, you know, I can't get in there. I'm, I'm a visiting scholar at the University of Pennsylvania Museum of Anthropology and Archeology. span And I, I really can get pretty good access to, to other collections. So I can't wait to, to go in there and I've been trying to get, you know, see if, see if they're found. Um, the sagittal dimension, maxillary insufficiency, mandibular insufficiency, and the vertical dimension. You can have excess or deficient vertical, deep bites or skeletal open bites. Um, Interior dental open bites are a little bit different. They don't necessarily accompany, but can lead to skeletal open bites. All right, you're ready? Yeah. Okay. Too tall. So what I like to do is open up the panorex and show the parents in bone crowding what that is. And, and it's the easiest thing to grasp that the kid's jaw is not wide enough for the teeth to fit. That means there's no room for the tongue. And she is uh, seven or eight years old. That means there wasn't room for this tongue when she was about three or two, all right? Very young. This doesn't happen real quick. This is, this is how she came out of the gate. So um, what I do is I come over to Pam. And she, she I don't right. remember. She and may have start, a frostbite. Um, I show that, the parents the, the width of the crown, always and I like the parents to understand that teeth from grow the upper midline to the side mm, of the crossbite. Like so this kid has a closer crossbite. It's on the, the crown side. first, obviously. And I don't know. Well, we can't hear you um, talk over the recording. So you want to stop the recording so you can. And she's. No, um, I'll do that again. Okay. They're usually between seven and eight millimeters wide. There's some overlap here, so I'm going to come over to this one. They're usually about the same width. Yeah, seven, seven and a half is, is real common. I think I'm getting some overlap from this crown. That's why this one looks so big. So I'm just going to. And then I show the path of eruption. So you take the long axis of the tooth. That's where this tooth is headed. These laterals are 90 degrees rotated, okay? If they were derotated, the distal aspect of the uh, lateral would be touching the mesial aspect of the interrupted bicuspid. And that means that this seven and a half to eight millimeter tooth will not, when she's 11, 12, or 13, when that would come in, will not have adequate space. That means there's no tongue space now. So. They used to, when I was a kid, they saw me and they said, oh, we'll wait till he's 11 and we'll just pull these teeth on him. So what we do there, we show the end bone crowding. We, we say, you know, parents don't know this, but this tooth is its adult width by two years old. Okay, they're, they're, you know, it won't get any wider. And we measure from the mesial uh, of, of the first bicuspid and the distal of the unerupted lateral and we know the distance from the tip of the primary canine to the tip of the primary canine, just like Bogue Index, from the Bolton Brush norm, normative database that was done over 30 years at Case Western uh, of, of really ideal occlusion. If, if that cusp tip to cusp tip, if that is not 31 millimeters by age five, forget it. 
the kid will get taller and the, the bony base will get bigger of the jaws. But that uh, at the crown tips, the transverse dimension does not appreciably grow. And that you can take, and I'm going to prove that with, with data from a longitudinal study at, at Case Western. This is the same kid, okay, at 14. He was in last week, and I mm -hmm. knew I was going to be talking to you guys. So, you know, I, I just wanted to show, you know, you know <laughs> you're going to be almost ready to get his braces off. Well, you're not seeing that. This isn't to show case studies. I just want to show treatment effects, okay? McNamara showed that if you expand from the University of Michigan, class three, you know, maxillary insufficient uh, in the sagittal dimension patients before the eight, age of eight, you will open up the pterygo maxillary suture. And this whole maxillary complex will come forward and counterclockwise rotate just like an MMA surgery that some really good surgeons do. The posterior nasal spine comes down and forward. The anterior nasal spine comes forward and up. And what's connected to the posterior nasal spine? the anterior wall of the nasal pharynx. It's called the soft palate, right? And I'm gonna show you that treatment effect. And then also, I'm gonna show how you can measure the treatment effect. Linder Aronson was, was an orthodontist in Sweden in the 70s who try, was trying to save money for the Swedish National Health Service because all these kids were getting their adenoids out and they knew there were some kids that had enlarged adenoids but didn't have sleep or breathing problems. And now we know why. I'm gonna show that later on here. So the Bolton brush study, that's the one that was done at Case Western. It was the first um, cephalometric x-ray that they had there. Um, and in the 80s, uh, Dr. Behrens, um, he did a study and they're still, he would, they were looking at people that are in their 80s and 90s that were started in the early 1930s. And he reported, he didn't show any pictures, they still had good occlusions. Now, the, the in, inclusion criteria to be in the study, there was a big status symbol in Cleveland, if you could be in this, because that means your child was uh, well-born, not rich necessarily, not wealthy, they, they clarified that, but, and they were, they were being raised well. Well, they, they took all these and they determined, starting at age three, that there are certain kids that will not need braces, okay? And they were conjecturing then. And then as, they, as the cohort got older, they gradually eliminated certain people that still didn't have perfect teeth. And by the end of the study in the 1950s, um, they had a huge sample of really good looking kids that didn't need braces. Paul Newman was one of them, believe it or not. Uh, <clears throat> and so what, what they did retrospectively is they went back and measured the canine width from actually from birth all the way to like, I don't know, 20 years old. And they said, if you don't have this canine width at this uh, age, you will not grow. You will, you will not grow appropriately to avoid treatment, orthodontic treatment. Um, this is a Michigan growth study. These are all online. They're in the public, uh, at, on the AAO website. You don't have to be a member of the AAO to, to get access to these. I like these because they have CEPHs and these weren't kids that were you know, ideal. These were kids that were just randomly taken from uh, the school at the University of Michigan. It was a high school for faculty. And a lot of these kids had terrible occlusions, some as young as three. And I've, you know, I've got some of their study models and, and uh, <clears throat> stuff, x-rays. This is the, the Iowa study. Um, Dr. Bushara um, was my instructor when I was there. Um, Sam Bushara, he taught me growth and development and cephalometrics. And he's the one who said, distal step molar, class two, always a class two, will not self-correct cannot self-correct and it will always uh, get worse. And he, at the time he didn't really talk about airway. <clears throat> so it came later. So because we are um, given permission, if you will, by the AAO um, to address uh, you know, underbites, I'm, this is one of the cases I treated. Again, I'm not gonna really go into technique. Uh, that's for a different course, but we show how that pterygo maxillary suture expands and I've got data to show that this kid was a terrible sleeper and all of her sleep symptoms went away. Again, no time to do that, but, but you'll be able to see all that. And look at this, you know, look at her face. I mean, just look at the differences. So to be told, you know, in, in this, uh, not this parent, but I've heard about parents that have kids that have um, <clears throat> maxillary hypoplasia said, well, just wait till they're old enough to have surgery. 
uh, that, that really is not that common anymore. Most orthodontists really understand this is important to do. Um, this is a study that was done at Forsyth where Dr. Bogue uh, worked for a while. And these are untreated cases. This was published in 1944. They had kids with malocclusion. And what they showed was, they, they, the parents kept bringing them in yearly or every other year. What I did is I measured, I don't know the exact numbers from canine to canine in bulk index, you know, molar and molar. And I just cut and pasted these at every age. Look at that, no growth from three and a half to 10.1 years old. Look at the depth of the palate, okay? In class twos, everything got worse. Look at, at 3.5, that kid was class two. Look at that overjet. Look at the retrusion of the mandible, and it didn't change. Now, this was, you know, representative of a, a, a series of patients that, that did not get treatment. I don't know the number, and I, this, I wouldn't use this as, oh, this is my only evidence. I have lots more evidence. Dr. Boyd, um, what is the measurement, again, from canine to canine, the width? Well, you're going to see, but okay. I haven't come up. I haven't come up with an algorithm like Bolg index. You can say 24 millimeters plus a chronological age. Now, it's an index. It's not diagnostic. It points to something. You need to validate it with other metrics. But uh, for the canines, you'll see how we we took the data from the Bolton norms. I had to hand with a caliper go and measure each of these uh, uh, tracings. So <clears throat> um, here's what we did. Okay, I have this book. It was being thrown out of our hospital library because not one person checked it out. Uh, you know, and we have a dental residency there and we taught ortho. Not one person ever checked this book out and it was in the dustbin. So I got it for free. It's worth about $500 now. So I measured all these acetates at every age and I put them in this table and my, one of my dental assistants, who's also a physician who now wants to be a dentist instead of an OB gynae, She's been with Gigi, she's been with me almost two years now. Um, and she's a biostats person and put this together and put together and put this linearly and then put it in a graph. So what this says is by age two, okay, a child should be able to get close to achieving 30 millimeters, but certainly by age four, they should have 30 millimeters, okay? By age five and certainly by age six, by wait, where are we? six to seven, they should be 31 and so on, okay? That this is, these are all these kids that had perfect occlusions in Cleveland. And, you know, by the time they were 20, they didn't need, they had perfect, even erupted third molars. Uh, ben would give them an A plus for the way they grew. Uh, so anyway, um, we simplified this a little bit and I will give this, or Lauren, this is being recorded. So anybody can have these slides. And you can do this, it's very reliable. It comes from the Bolton brush norm. So these are things that you can do to show parents if their kids canines at the cuss tips, don't measure this, then they're already probably at risk for sleep and breathing problems, much less predictable, uh, you know, more complicated malocclusion, the older they get, all right? This is from the Michigan trial um, and this kid uh, was how old? Six years old when when we started. Uh, when we didn't start, these this is just randomly chosen. You can see there's there's vertical skeletal vertical growth here, uh, class two molar, class two skeletal. Um, the adenoid area is very close to the soft palate. Adenoids involute, you know, or they get them taken out. And I don't have any medical records on these kids, but I think this kid had an adenoidectomy because it looks like a good surgical carving here but the class two is still there and the vertical growth is still there. This is the same kid at 13, all right? So now ready for orthodontic treatment, how about it? Um, here's a kid at three um, and same thing, deep narrow palate, all right? Class two, uh, distal step, um, this curvature of the cervical spine, usually when, when the nasal pharynx is narrow, a kid will do that because they have to keep their lips closed during the ceph, biting down and it opens up, it stretches the hypopharynx or the laryngeal pharynx. Um, this curvature tends to go away. When we start expanding kids, do myofunctional therapy, do uh, tongue and lip releases when they're, when they're needed, uh, get them chewing hard foods uh, and breathing through their nose, taping their lips if they have to, uh, that this, they look like they've gone to ballet school. Their, their cervical spine posture gets so much better. Uh, and it, that's just something we noticed. 
Um, so anyway, I'll, I'm, I'm gonna go through these. These are cases that I've treated, okay? And I just wanna show you, and I'm not gonna show pictures on everybody. I just, um, this is the in bone crowding, right? All right, and look at this. This is after expansion. Uh, <clears throat> there's still work to do, but now there's more tongue space, so there's more room for the permanent teeth. There's the Bogue index. Okay, so there it went from 30 to almost 36. More room for the tongue, uh, the, the roof of the mouth, floor of the nose, same wall, gets bigger. Okay, now to measure the adenoid space, according to Linda Aronson, look at that. Okay, now you can't see those, but watch this. And we're, what we're trying to do is correlate. We're doing a retrospective trial at Lurie Children's Hospital um, for, uh, on these kids that we've treated. Most of them were referred from healthcare professionals, either you know, pulmonary people, ENTs, pediatricians, um, uh, sleep medicine docs, allergists, uh, myofunctional therapists. But look at that, look at that. That looks like the kid had surgery. Now, would that have happened just with age? Not according to Linda Aronson. Um, and you know, this, you can do this. You don't need a cone beam to do this. You need two dimensional x-rays, but if you want to show correlations to three dimensional changes, you would need a cone beam. Okay. So, I mean, let me, you know, I do that. Um, did the kid have myofunctional? Yes. We recommended it. Did he wear a face mask? I put reverse pull face masks, not on just class threes, but also class twos and class ones. I make class twos worse so you can get the mandible further forward. So you can see though, the, the, the um, mesial of the, four, of the first by and the distal of the lateral and bone crowding, okay? This is all widening up, okay? That's like two and a half, three years. Pogue index increases and that adenoid space, look at this nasopharynx compared to this. And there's the adenoid one, adenoid two. This measure should always be about 20 millimeters by eight and a half years old if a kid is gonna have the structure uh, necessary for nose breathing. You need more than structure, but, but that sets it up. That's what we do. I'm a dentist, I do the ortho. Um, I don't pretend to be an airway doctor or a uh, pulmonologist or anything. I'm not practicing medicine without a license, but often what I do as a dentist will provide all kinds of systemic benefits to children relative to airway uh, competence. And you can see the difference uh, when we blow those up. Look at that. Look at that. I mean, that is just in, I really had, I not found this article by Linda Aronson. I wouldn't have been able to measure this. There's other people in Europe that are doing this um, that I won't go into now, but um, so there, there's still work to do. I like this number, this minimum area from, from the posterior pharynx to the anterior to, to exceed 100. Uh, it, as, as quickly as possible. Um, and then I always do, you know, the sleep assessment. And I say that when all these yeses turn into no's, that means the kid is breathing all no's. All no's means mm -hmm. breathing through the nose. Um, so again, I'm trying to get through this so we can have time. It's yeah, almost... so we can, it's really remarkable. And um, good. Let's well, here, one here, more. I'm gonna do a few more of these. Um, look at that. And the adenoids didn't even shrink in this kid. You don't have to, I've had kids and parents, I don't want him to undergo surgery. Let's, and, and some of the ENTs know me, okay, let boy do what he's gonna do. And it, you know, if it doesn't work, I, I get him, I'll send him to the What ENT. is your experience with the tonsils, Dr. Boyd? Well, the, the whole thing with tonsils and adenoids are that, um, you know, you have to eliminate, what, what is the problem? It's lymph tissue. Does the kid have an allergy? Is it environmental allergy? Is it food allergy? Um, are they mouth breathing, airborne pathogens? In, in, in really, I say, I give, I try to give bigger structure, but when I see Edna, this kid had an, um, an ENT console. I mean, or, or it's in my chart notes that, you know, our responsibility is not to say, I can make them big, you don't need an ENT. That's not up to me. This gets an ENT console when that, when that uh, nasopharynx is that narrow, okay? That doesn't mean, I, and I always tell parents, I'm going to, it's a consult. It doesn't mean your kid is going to need surgery. It's a consult. And that's my responsibility. We, uh, and again, the airway, I see it, I hear it all the time. That's the domain of the ENT. The orthodontists say it all the time. That's their domain. No, it's not just their domain. That's what you're implying. It's our domain. 
we share it, the craniofacial respiratory complex. It is a shared domain. And you know, this is for dentists who, if you really wanna learn this, um, then it will become part of your domain. If you don't, at least learn how to screen and make the refer, make the appropriate referrals. I'm not suggesting everybody needs to do this. It ain't for everybody. Um, and then I think this is the last case I'm gonna okay. show. Um, and again, I, I'm not even showing uh, her x-rays. He, she just had a, a marvelous response. Oh, I guess there's one more. Let's do one more. Bingo. Pretty cool, huh? And all the, you know, yeses come to nose. The last thing I'm gonna give you, okay? Well, what if a kid won't open his mouth? You know, you're a pedodontist. You know what? Every child, I tell every parent, kids are hardwired to not only be obstinate, ter terrible twos, they are hardwired to be obedient. How do I know that's true? Because we're here, we have not gone extinct. And if children didn't inherit their culture and do what the elders of the tribe wanted them to do, and we were hunter-gatherers for a quarter of a million years, if not longer, before we discovered agriculture and industry. So this is where I learned most of this. And it's really informed my work as a pediatric dentist. Um, All right. So this is, okay, this is the last thing I want you to know. Keep holding me, this is your face, right? And so do you see your airway? This is what you breathe through, okay? You see how little it is and how curvy? So this is what you said. He said, you're doing so great because look at the change. This is today. See how straight that is? Is it wider or narrower? It's wider. Do you know what happens when it's wider? It's easier for you to breathe. So this is where it makes it easier for you to breathe. Do you see the difference? Isn't that awesome? You can see it Mommy, tell him about his cervical spine there, how it twists and curves. This is kind of cool, too. So look at that. Those are your bones. You kind of not see them that great there. You see your bones? That's your head tilting way back so that you can see, so that you can breathe. You had to do that because your airway is so small. But on this one, see how straight it is? Yeah, that's so much better for your body. It gets straight and it gets straight, and that allows your airway to be open and you can breathe better. You know what happens when you can breathe better? You run faster. You get taller. You get taller. Cool. You're a little happier, right? Mom, what do you do for a living? Are you a doctor? I am not a doctor. I am a civil engineer, a project manager. Wow, do you get the engineering part of it? I do. I get and all of that. Bioengineer, you should call yourself. Thank you for that. <laughs> So proud of your boy. You are yeah. amazing. So you know what I call her? What? I'm a better parent. You guys, if you get the parents on board, if parents can be shown that this is in the best short and long-term health interest of their child, that kid will be so cooperative. They want to please. Look at me, mom, dive off the diving board. This is no different. And that mom, you know, that kid would do, he was so cooperative. He did everything. And it isn't, you know, they're all potentially just wonderful cooperators, but you must get the adult caregiver on board. So that's it. That's all I got. <clears throat> that's wonderful. So why don't you um, stop the share? We'll just address some of the um, questions. One that popped up is what is your most preferred technique for correcting the uh, maxillary transverse deficiency in deciduous dentition? Widening the jaw. <laughs> so. <laughs> Right. Everyone, everyone's looking for a mousetrap, and I don't blame you. Um, I've got to go to appliance, um, but you know, at that age, I like it to be fixed. Um, but if the mom, who knows, that's another thing. I like to empower parents. Nobody knows that child better than a kid's parent, especially the mom. No offense, dad. Our Y chromosome um, hurts us a little bit. <laughs> And moms get it. And if a mom says, you know, I don't think you'll wear it, guess what? He ain't gonna wear it. So I, what I usually do is I say, um, is your kid a rule follower? And then I count to three in my head. And if it takes longer than three seconds, I have my answer. And then I recommend fixed. Now there's so many different kinds, Lauren. So I don't want to give like what's- I know, and, and it was, it's, this is not really a technique course, but I guess maybe you can answer then the, the $10 million question tonight. At, as early as what age can we start? with interceptive orthodontics? When the kid has absolutely quantifiable malocclusion in you know, three dimensions, transverse is first, 
and it's the easiest to fix. And if that's all you do, you're doing a service. If a kid has vertical sensitivity, adenoid face, we call it, and you know maxillary transfer, you must put occlusal coverage. You must control that posterior vertical development. And, and you know that that's just, there's complications. That's why I don't like giving answers. So, okay, he right. said this, and now you're gonna open up a bite worse. So right. just have to be careful. <clears throat> so what about myofunctional appliances, um, like the Myo Munchie, the Myo Brace? I, um, can you touch on that a little bit? Yeah, and I, again, um, I, I feel myofunctional uh, competence should be achieved by every dental student for that matter, but even speech pathologists don't get this and dental, dental hygienists don't get it. You need to go to one like AHS, AHS's <laughs> courses and uh, there's other courses that do this. You need to understand. I thought it was voodoo when I first heard about myofunctional therapy. I just did. And man, am I a believer. I, every single one of my patients gets it recommended. And if a kid's not ready financially, that's one obstacle. Or if mom doesn't think he's gonna do it, a mile munchie, a mile brace, uh, you know, there's, there's so many U concept, uh, and, and what's the one, um, healthy start. There are so many, and, and getting a kid to start eating raw carrots, that's a myofunctional appliance. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is. So that's, that's how I feel about it. How much of a problem is an untreated tongue tie when starting orthodontics on an adolescent or younger child? Well, I work, um, with, Saru Zaghi, uh, and he trained Milt Gavilis, who's here in Chicago, comes to my office on uh, Thursdays, and he likes me to build a house for the tongue to live in. So he just says, let Boyd widen that jaw because I'm gonna cut that tongue loose and it's gonna have nowhere to go. So very, very few exceptions to that. But my suggestion is have a good relationship with a myofunctional therapist, and somebody who performs the releases. I do not diagnose tongue tie because I don't treat them. I assess the risk. I do Larry Kotlow's, but uh, Hasselbacher has one, is that you do risk assessment. If you don't do treatment, you don't diagnose if, you, you know, if it's not within your scope of, of services that you provide. That's how I feel. Well, I love this question because it kind of teased me up here. Rose wants to know, what courses would you recommend for expansion in deciduous teeth? <laughs> well, I'm um, signed on with Ben and Lauren. I've followed Ben for years. We both kind of grew up together in this whole realm of dentistry and anthropology. And um, I guess I acquired the talents of Lauren by uh, approaching Ben. And um, I pretty much said, Ben, watching Ben and what he's done over the last 10 years from where we both started, I was like, this is amazing. And I said, if, if this was a, a, a K through eight school, I want to teach preschool. I want to be your preschool superintendent. I want to run the preschool aspect of it. So that's what I'm, um, I'm going to be teaching a course uh, <clears throat> in Florida. Um, <clears throat> if you move to Chicago, you can take my and Darius's course. Um, he's a sleep medicine physician, but Darius is going to be lecturing with us in Florida. Um, and so hopefully there will be more of these and things will spin off from, from Ben and Lauren's uh, efforts here. <clears throat> you right. and, then, and we do it in stages too. So we'll go over that in a little bit. Um, so the, the, I guess, what's the earliest you've treated? Because <laughs> they well, want to know how early can you? What's yeah. the earliest? Well, well, let's go back to assessment. First, sure. you have to assess, and you have to do a definitive assessment and definitive diagnosis. Um, and we're, you know, we are hypothesizing this can be picked up at 20 weeks in utero on an ultrasound. Um, so more later on that. But certainly, um, when you see it, a kid doesn't even have to have teeth. You know, I learned that all babies are born retroanatic because it helps them negotiate the birth canal. It doesn't work that way. The, the chin doesn't go anywhere near the pelvis when a baby's exiting the birth canal. That was made up by a very famous orthodontist whose name I won't mention, rest in peace, he's no longer with us, but he had a, not a shred of evidence in his textbook for that claim. So um, if you see it, even before there's teeth, it will persist 
it will worsen. It either is already or will become comorbidity with sleep and breathing disorders. So um, the earliest time to, I like to have 20 teeth before I, and that's usually two and a half to three years old. And that's consistent with what's published from Journal of the American Medical Association in 1922, 100 years ago. 30 months of age is the ideal time to treat, not to correct irregularities of the teeth, to straighten the teeth, to make more room for the tongue such that the child can breathe through the nose while they're awake and asleep for a lifetime. Okay, so that's what this is all predicated on. So if, if you got a parent that understands it, that is curious, um, and they want to do it, and, and the, the, the kid is on, you know, that they're, they want to help their kid through it, start them at two and a half. But start preparing them, you know, at, at 18 months, 20 months, start, you know, with, with myobrace and baby lead weaning and uh, <clears throat> and I'm getting about 10 questions on um, your preference with the children that you treat under six with removable or fixed expansion appliances. Can you just do, give an overview of that? Well, I, I like to say if, if they're at least a year away from getting, um, you know, their permanent molars, their six year molars, I call that phase one part A. I charge half my phase one fee. And I don't bill out the other half till they have at least eight to 10 permanent teeth. And it's double of what it was three years before. So it protects against inflation. Nobody complains about it. I, I don't burn them out. Okay, so I always start on the upper and I don't put a lower one in. The lower will follow. And you really, until you have six-year molars, the six-year molars can get left behind when you're expanding the lower arch, when you're developing it. There's no suture down there. There's a suture upstairs. So you're spreading the entire uh, pelvic, each, each, each pelvic half. And within <clears throat> the alveolus of, of each pelvic half are the follicles of the teeth, including the six-year molars. So they go with it. You, you never leave those behind. So I don't like to, to do that. And I decide, I, I, I really like trying removable. Uh, I'll take like <clears throat> an upper one and put a crucial coverage on it. Uh, and I'll line it with glue if the kid just can't do it. So it starts out removable, but you're, you're gonna make some mistakes. And I say, when you first start this and you know, I, oh, I think I can go with the removable and the kid loses it, you should eat that. It's, it's goodwill to say, I'm sorry, I made a bad decision. Parents really appreciate it when you could admit that I didn't, you know, I should have listened to you, mom. You said he right, wouldn't right. wear, you know? <laughs> so. Right, right. Well, um, there, there's so many questions here and a lot of this has to do with the technique and that's why you know, we couldn't possibly go through this in an hour. So we do have your two day course in Florida and it's also will be held virtually um, April 1st and 2nd. So we're really excited. I know um, Dr. Ben Morali will be there. Dr. Brett Christensen will also be there. You know, everyone's continually learning, which is really um, exciting. But I guess maybe you can help. There's one recurring question that keeps um, coming up is that people are afraid of stepping on specialists' toes, like the pedodontist in particular, or the general dentist um, stepping on the orthodontist's toes. You want to give your opinion on that as far as it's concerned with growth I and development? Really do. I really do. Um, first of all, when you were in dental school, and this is purported to be um, said at a senior dental school address by the dean. I'm not gonna say which dean and what school, uh, but it's like, well, you guys, uh, tomorrow's graduation. And I just wanna say, you know, the top third of the class, you know, you are gonna be the O specialists, the orthodontists and the oral surgeons, top of the cream. These are the smartest people in our classes. They just, you know, that's the way it was. You middle third, you guys are gonna be the researchers. You're gonna be making discoveries that's gonna benefit mankind. And the bottom third, you're gonna be the richest bastards on the planet. And you know, that was just sort of a, a joke, but you know, I, I, these are smart people, these orthodontists. And, and really it's just, it, it's sort of, it's a shared domain, just like the airway is a shared domain, not just of the ENTs, but ours. And growing children, this is actually, and I think it's general dentists. I don't know if it's mostly general dentists here, but I think you guys are gonna save the world. Because most specialists in ortho and pedo, they're so comfortable doing what they're doing, putting out sugar fires, which needs to be done. That's what I learned how to do. Um, and straightening, you know, mostly permanent teeth. And, and 
make a good living at that and you're, you're kind of taught that you shouldn't do ortho at, at, at a young age, you just grow up believing that. Those are the, the, the professors are the high priests uh, you know, of our specialty. I was lucky, I went to Iowa. Oh my God, we had so much ortho. Uh, well, because our, our clinical director was um, uh, not the best friend of the ortho director. They loved okay. making each other angry. <laughs> Like well, I know that um, a lot of the questions are about the courses, so I'm going to go ahead and give some information. But Dr. Boyd, you took Dr. Moralia's pediatric mini residency. I know I you did. did an overview, and you insisted that this was a, a prerequisite for your course um, to get a foundation. So, if you're interested in learning um, Dr. Boyd's techniques, we highly recommend uh, it's a prerequisite to take. Dr. Moralia's pediatric mini residency. You don't need to take the adult as a prerequisite, but it gives you the base foundation of working with expansion appliances, the diagnostics, um, interdisciplinary collaboration, myofunctional therapy, all the basics that you need. So then you can jump right in to Dr. Boyd's advanced mini residency. And we're super excited about this because Dr. Boyd, as we're developing this, you know, this is really your first technique course. Um, that you're kind of giving away your secret sauce, you know? So a lot of these questions, everyone, everyone wants to know your secret sauce. And um, in order to do that, you really just need to come join us in Hollywood, Florida in April. Um, I want to thank Sleep Group Solutions for hosting us. We're going to go over some diagnostics of the rhinometer there and the echo vision. I know um, you're, you should be getting the echo vision any day now, right? I think to, to begin some of the diagnostic training. Dr. Moralia has gotten it, Dr. Brett Christensen. So we're excited about that. You'll, you'll learn the tools. And tell us a little bit about um, Dr. Darius and how um, you guys collaborate for day two. There's a lot of that sleep medicine in day two. I got, um, it was serendipitous. I, I'm on staff at Lurie Children's Hospital. It used to be called Children's Memorial. And I was at a lunchtime staff meeting and I sat next to the head of sleep medicine and we both had heard of each other mainly because you know I was doing something called orthotropics and which is very airway friendly and he was he just was so fed up with pediatricians not knowing anything about sleep and he goes I'm going to train some dentists and I'm, I'm going to start with you and he did and, and eventually he took me to St. Louis University and trained me and some other dentists in sleep medicine assessment actually like certification in it um and I got appointed to the sleep medicine uh, um, faculty at, at Lurie. I'm still, on, I'm still on the faculty there. Well, Darius wasn't attending there. And he's like, I would go like on rounds, like in a club palate clinic and Darius would bring us in and he would teach us sleep medicine and we would show him and we taught him dentistry and malocclusion. And he's like, how did I ever get along without you guys? And now, <laughs> He is just like, he won't, he doesn't want to do anything. He's in, now we're doing home sleep tests. He's got a grant to do that. So we're doing a lot of work together and you got, we'll have some really powerful data. Plus Brett Christensen turned us on to um, pharyngometry and nasorhinometry. So um, we're going to have some data uh, on that when it comes up too. So, um, and Darius is really excited that I'm going to be doing that. So wonderful. And I just want to share to everyone, um, Dr. Brett Christensen, he's an orthodontist and he shared, I think he meant to share to everybody, but he just shared to the panelists about stepping on toes. He said, quit worrying about stepping on toes. You're not treating your colleagues, you're treating the patients. So um, again, it's really, once you learn the techniques, it's a great skill set to have. Then um, people were asking about treatment of all ages. So we have an advanced course with Dr. Ben Moralia um, for teens to do fixed expansion appliances in teens. Again, it's an advanced technique. So we highly, highly, highly recommend you take the mini residency first. Um, and he'll also teach uh, the expansive techniques using bracket and wires. So you'll build the foundation first and then learn an expansive technique that Dr. Ben Riley has been using um, you know, for 18 years or so. So this is 100% virtual. Uh, so everyone, there is not a limit to seating, but we do like to keep the class sizes relatively small to have enough time for um, Q&A. So that's June 3rd and June 10th. If anyone has a dire need to treat that age group earlier, reach out to me and we can talk about getting some of the recordings to get you started. Um, perhaps your own children, I have a lot of requests for that. So visit our website slash advanced to learn more information on that. 
And Dr. Moralia, uh, excuse me, Dr. Boyd, your myofunctional therapist is going to take our course. I'm so excited for that. But March 4th and 11th, we're actually teaching how to integrate myo into the dental practice. And both Brittany Sierra and Carice Laguerre, they're fabulous, passionate instructors who are very successful business women as well. So they can really share um, all their techniques to build the competence and the confidence to get you going from RDH to um, an oral facial myofunctional therapist. We're also welcoming dentists who want to take this as well. So we are offering an exclusive, exclusive offer for those attending tonight, which I'll send in the follow-up email. Kind of a BOGO situation, buy one, get one. So if you as a dentist want to learn more about that, and then you can register your hygienist for 50% off or just additional team members. So um, we will send the follow-up email for that as well. We have our live events with live links to learn more about it. So this will be in the follow-up email, but we're going to be in Nashville in July, all of us, Dr. Boyd, Dr. Moralia, myself, Carice, um, and uh, Brittany. So join us for a team doctor learn. This is really, really uh, great to get your team on board, um, to learn from the experts in airway health and also Clear Alignia University on July 9th. Um, you're going to learn how to speak from the hygiene chair and how to get cases accepted from start to finish. And then please save the date. We're having our first annual, because I'm very hopeful that we're gonna have a great buzz around this where we're having experts um, in airway from, from all over the spectrum join us for two days of a really, really um, exclusive, uh, fascinating um, weekend. It's gonna be a gala event. That's gonna be in Savannah, Georgia at the Westin Hotel. So stay tuned for more information. Um, some of the questions were asked about resources for parents, so I thought I'd just share it here. Um, if you want a 5% discount, some of these orders can add up. Please reach out for me, and I'll place the order for you to get that our group discount. Happy to do that. That's sleepmedicinemarketing.com. And I know, Dr. Boyd, you're a huge fan of the ADA brochure. So um, you can just order that, but we think that this is such a great uh, way to... to kind of get the pediatrician on board, right? So if the parents give this to the pediatrician and they see the ADA seal, it's very helpful to validate everything that you're explaining to the patient. And it's also great for the patient to see that validation. Um, you use this brochure, right, Dr. Boyd? Yeah, you know, is there any way I can answer a question that I just saw? Yeah, of course. I just know, um, let me just, go ahead, you do that. And I'll finish up this deck. So if people want to drop off, then we can, um, if you're willing to answer more questions, would love to stay on. But some of the questions were, where can they find airway-centric dentists? So if you look, um, airwayhealthsolutions.com forward slash locator, especially for the myofunctional therapists that are on the speech language pathologists, you'll find like-minded dentists, orthodontists, pedodontists on this locator. So that's helpful. Once you take our course, you can also be on our locator. Um, our upcoming conversation is Wednesday, February 23rd with Dr. Nelly Silva. It is Heart Health Month, so we thought let's talk, let's talk about airway and heart health. So you can register for that in a follow-up email. Tuesday, March 15th, we're having Dr. Gelb treating the TMD patient. And I am going to actually announce here before I do the press release that we are thrilled that Dr. Gelb is joining AHS faculty and uh, we'll be offering a course on May 20th, uh, digital, excuse me, virtual, on the acute TMD patient, getting them ready for ortho. So stay tuned for that press release. I, I don't think Dr. Gelb is on tonight, but we really welcome him to faculty. He'll, he'll be such an important integral part of our overall portfolio. So welcome Dr. Gelb. And then Wednesday, March 23rd, will be Dr. Hal Stewart on airway-centered restorative dentistry and Dr. Susan Maples, April 13th, on the impact of allergies on pediatric airway disorders. Sometimes that's an overlooked topic. So really excited about that. Um, a special announcement we already had, we have a lot of things up our sleeves at Airway Health Solutions. We are launching our own airway health aligners. So we are really excited about this. We're partnering with um, Ollendorf Appliance Lab. We're taking orders uh, February 15th, and this is exclusive to our AHS alumni. So um, if you want to get the benefits of Dr. Ben Moralia's preferences and proprietary um, software setups, um, take our course, and then you can also uh, be eligible to use our airway health aligners where we assure that you'll get an expansive setup. Um, that's, that's the way you want it for airway health. You also get one-on-one -on -one tech support, the unlimited amount of aligners, 
you know, you can stage the aligners as one refinement and also a setup of the upper and lower retainers. So we are just like over the moon with this. So uh, February 14th, we love clear aligners and we love Valentine's Day. So stay tuned for more information on that. All right, Dr. Boyd, if you want to answer some more questions, we're more than happy. If you're willing, I'm more than happy to stay on. I know there was a lot, so go ahead. Well, I can do a few. I've got an AAPMD meeting with, um, okay. uh, but I, I'll stay for five minutes. But the one sure. question is, um, why in the world would you protract a maxilla on a class two patient or a class one patient? And I'm going to answer the question with a question. All right. Um, as anyone, everybody knows what maxillomandibular advancement surgery is, right? And, and we, all, we all know that um, the primary uh, condition that people seek it out other than cosmetics is sleep apnea. It's like one of the few things in the world that provides over 92% cure of the problem for which they seek the treatment. So I pose this question to several oral surgeons. One, um, of whom some of you have heard of. He's, he uh, learned from Larry Wolford, who did the first MMAs in Texas. But, you know, and I said to him, um, tell me if the problem requires advancement of both jaws to solve it, what must be the pre treatment skeletal diagnosis if you have to bring the maxilla forward and the man mandible forward? What must that pre-treatment skeletal diagnosis be? And you know, most people answer class two, maybe class three sometimes. That's wrong. It's not right. There is no, there is no angle classification. I call it class four. It's by maxillary retrusion. And when does it first show up? In the deciduous dentition. But you need an x-ray. Who's gonna take an x-ray on a three-year-old? He's got two thumbs, okay? I got a comb beat and you can read about radiation safety, minimal exposure time, minimum dosage, maximum resolution. Kid has to sit still for 4.8 seconds. So I'm telling you that the maxilla, if you have a mandible, okay, it's way back, class two, right? We all know that, okay? And the maxilla is also back, but not in a crossbite. That gets missed all the time, not by me. And not, it's not that I'm that smart. I wasn't in that top third, believe me. Um, and this has just sort of been passed by. Maxillary mm -hmm. retrusion is a problem. And anybody who's had an MMA surgery started out with maxillomandibular retrusion, class four malocclusion. Mm -hmm. how, about we just, how about we relaunch the poll? Um, and see a quick result. Oh, that'd be yeah, I know, I know you're curious because you like something tangible. So if I know we have about 92 participants still on, can you please just re-poll um, the two questions? What age do you recommend children be screened for malocclusion? And what age do you recommend children diagnosed with malocclusion be treated or referred for treatment? That was very effective, <laughs> Dr. Boyd. Good. So are you getting how many, what percentage? Yeah. Of can you see, can you see it yet? Or I have to. No, I, I just see the poll, but I, I don't see it. Oh, you else. don't see it. Okay. So is everyone locked in? I'm, I'm going to go ahead and share the results. Can you see that? Okay. Um, and maybe click on poll. I don't know how it is on your end. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm glad that seven thing is out of there. Yeah, so that was number one. But look at that difference. So, so yeah. kudos and thanks for sharing your your knowledge. So it's, it's if, I cat, um, if I was a cat, I'd be purring right now. <laughs> well, this is wonderful, and don't worry, everyone. Dr. Boyd is on faculty, so we'll be doing these, you know, um, all throughout the year. And again, another advantage of joining our alumni is we do private Facebook groups where it's more of a town hall. Um, interactive where we hold it as a meeting, not a webinar. So everyone comes on screen and, and it's a little bit more casual. Um, so uh, you really get a lot of benefit by becoming an AHS alumni. And um, we look forward to uh, having these conversations again, as long as you guys keep coming. 
we'll keep hosting. So thank you, Dr. Boyd. Really appreciate everything you do. I can only imagine in 30 years the amount of lives you saved. I mean, you must sleep like a baby at night. So all the work you do, congratulations and thank you. Great. Thank you, Lauren, for organizing. It's it. my pleasure. And good night, everyone. Thanks for your commitment uh, to good health. And we'll see you soon. Take care.